Welcome to Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'm Steve Schwetz, and our study brings us to chapters 34 and 35 in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. But before we begin, Dr. McGee recorded a few thoughts to get us started. Those of you that are following our broadcast through Isaiah and through the Bible know that we are in a section now where we're seeing many prophecies concerning the nations that were around and contiguous to the land of Israel. We can be sure of one thing, that this piece of real estate that God gave to Abraham 2,000 years before Christ is the most sensitive piece of real estate there is in the world. We can know one thing, that the land and the people go together. They were in that land when they obeyed God. When they disobeyed God, God put them out of the land. They're back in the land today. That is a few, not many. But frankly, they are not obedient to God today. I don't think anyone is prepared to say that, that they've turned back to the Lord God of heaven of the Old Testament who sent the Lord Jesus Christ in to the world to be a savior for the world. But these prophecies that we have in the Old Testament, many of them have already been fulfilled. Many of them are future. I do not believe we're seeing the fulfillment of any of them at the present moment. And yet today, sensationalists are constantly calling attention to some of these, and they lift them out. And I'm sure those of you that have followed us through Isaiah realize that you just can't do that. That is not the way that you study the Word of God. You just can't lift out a verse here and a verse there and make some sort of a quilt of many patches and many colors. Now, I want us, therefore, to pay particular attention to the context as we go along, because it is very important. Now, to guide us along in our journey through the Bible has got some really great resources for you. First, there's Dr. McGee's free notes and outlines that you can get for each book that we study. And the quickest way and easiest way to get them is in our app or by downloading them in our companion book called Briefing the Bible. You can visit ttb.org forward slash Briefing the Bible to download it or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE to have an abridged paperback sent by mail. Now, when you call, also ask to be put on our monthly mailing list for our newsletter. Each newsletter is packed really with a bunch of great information, including extra Bible study materials from Dr. McGee, as well as information on the travels of our world prayer team. And every other month, we include a bookmark containing our Bible reading schedule. You can download the newsletter and the bookmark over at ttb.org. Or again, our number is 1-865-BIBLE. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that is as true today as it was in the times of Isaiah. As we study, help us to apply your truth to our lives so that we can grow in this gift of life that you've given us through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now we're off to Isaiah 34 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now today we come to the 34th chapter of Isaiah. If you have your Bible, you'll want to turn there. And we're coming to the end of this particular section where we've looked at six woes, and there's been a progression in this matter of prophecy. We saw a local situation into which Isaiah spoke, and then he moved out into that broader area as he looked down through the centuries to a time of judgment that was coming again. And those things that were immediately happening were merely a little figure of that which is to come a period of judgment that the Lord Jesus Christ labeled the Great Tribulation period. And then beyond that, the coming of the king. We've seen that. We saw that last time. The king is coming, but today we're not looking for the king. Actually, we're looking for our Savior. We're looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. After he takes the church out, the world will go through this time of trouble. 
that he labeled a great tribulation. And then at the end of that, the king is coming. We've seen that. And now we see before he comes, and that which will end, the war of Armageddon. Now this chapter, as we said last time, is in contradiction to the philosophy of this world. You see, man looks to the future as a time when he will so improve the world by his own efforts that he's going to build a utopia. He's going to bring in a millennium. He may call it something else. Man will be capable of lifting himself by his bootstraps, and that's the thinking today, the very basic philosophy of evolution. And by the way, evolution is a philosophy and not a science by any means because there's a difference of opinion about science relative to what happened here a million years ago. The whole philosophy is, though, that there's going to be improvement as we go along. It's onward and upward forever. Our day by day in every way, I'm getting better and better. That's the picture. Man has woven that into the fabric of life, that everything that you look at, and I don't care what it is that you look at, you can look at rug making. You go back and see how they used to do it, how they're doing it today. It's great improvement and what it's going to be in the future. They'll have the perfect rug in the future. Of course, they may be able to attain to that Persian rug where you sit on it and take off, and it has everything on it but a steering wheel. I don't know where it'll take you, but man's on the way, and he believes that we're moving into something great and good. And the interesting thing is that the Word of God looks forward to a day that's coming. Call it the millennium. It's going to be a better day but it's not the consummation of man's efforts. It's rather the kingdom that comes through God's power and glory. And before the kingdom is established, everything that man has built apart from God is coming under a frightful judgment. All of man's work is contrary to God, and it must come into a final conflict. Now, that final conflict is labeled in the last book of the Bible as the, actually not battle of Armageddon, but the war of Armageddon. And the sin of man will finally be headed up by the man of sin that will attempt to bring in a kingdom himself, and that kingdom is the great tribulation period. And it can only be ended by the coming of Christ to the earth to establish his kingdom. And this chapter here, Therefore, looks entirely to the future. The Assyrian has disappeared. Dalich has this statement, which I think is quite accurate. He says, we feel that we're carried away from the stage of history and are transported into the midst of the last things. And these chapters are the last steps whereby our prophet rises to the height at which he soars. Finally, when we come in chapters 40 to the end, after the fall of Assyria, and when darkness began to gather on the horizon again, Isaiah broke away from his own times. The end of all things became more and more his home. It was the revelation of the mystery of the incarnation of God for which all this was to prepare the way. This is tremendous. Now we come here, the indignation of the Lord poured out on all nations, that's in the first four verses. And then we are going to see Idjumea, the target and figure of all God's enemies. And then the intention of the Lord. That is, it's the intention of the Lord that the day of the Lord's vengeance is coming. Now will you notice this? We have in verse one, come near ye nations to hear and hearken ye people let the earth hear and all that is there in the world and all things that come forth of it. Now, back at the very beginning of Isaiah, in Isaiah, the first chapter, verse 2, God called heaven and earth to witness of his judgment to his own people Israel. Now, in this chapter, God calls only the nations of the earth to witness his final judgment upon all the nations. And here it is, verse 2. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies 
He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Now notice the words that have been chosen here to depict this judgment. Indignation, fury, utterly destroyed and delivered to the slaughter. Why, they are the strongest possible expressions that could be used. And the judgment is universal and it's severe. It's not only the time of Jacob's trouble, it's the time of the earth's travail. And our Lord spoke of this as a time of unparalleled suffering in the history of the world. The seals, the trumpets, and the vials in the book of Revelation all intensify and confirm this. My friend, whether you believe it or not, the earth that you and I are living in today is moving to the judgment of God. It's coming. Verse 3, their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountain shall be melted with their blood. May I say that this to me is probably the most repulsive and terrible verse with this description that's in the book of God. I can't think of anything that's worse than this. Now, may I say to you, this confirms what the Lord Jesus said, what the book of Revelation teaches, that there is coming a judgment upon this earth. And I'm sure a great many people doubt it, but I noticed that down in the Gulf here several years ago, when that tropical hurricane, I forget the name of it, it broke on the Gulf Coast there. We traveled along there. We drove for miles, and there are places there that entire sections of cities were taken out. Just absolutely, they were removed. And even after several years, there's nothing in there. There are places where that jungle in that area was just absolutely taken out. Now, there was an apartment house where apparently a group of people that were living fast and furious were, they decided they wouldn't leave. They didn't believe the storm was going to be that bad, so they decided to have a great big beer bus. And instead of leaving, they all got drunk, and they all were killed. Now, they didn't believe that storm was going to come. They ridiculed it. You can do that relative to this earth today. But may I say to you, the Word of God says judgment is coming on the earth. Now, I say that calmly today, but it's coming. And this section through here emphasizes that. Notice verse 4. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. And all the king's men and all the king's horses won't be able to put it back together again. My friend, when you see that little leaf fall off of the tree, you can get Elmer's glue and put it back. Won't do a bit of good. It's not going to stay. It's not going to live. Judgment is coming. You can't keep it from coming, and you can't do a thing in the world about it except just one thing. Make sure that you've got to the shelter. Make sure that you're going to miss the storm. Make sure that you're going to listen to God and remember that he, the Lord Jesus, is a shelter in a time of storm that's coming upon the earth. Now, that's the picture that you have here. Now, he uses a figure of speech beginning here from verse 5. He says, For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. Now, God bathes that sword in heaven. That's important to see. When you and I take the sword down here, it's for vengeance or it's for some ulterior motive. When God does it, it's to bring justice and righteousness upon the earth. God's sword is bathed in heaven, and it's going to fall. He says it's going to fall. And the word down here, it's upon Idumea. Idumea is Edom. And Edom is Esau. And Esau represents the flesh, means red. It represents all of the humanity that's in Adam that are rebellious against God and God's people. 
God says, Esau have I hated. God will judge Edom because they're anti-God, they're anti-Christ, anti-Bible, anti-good, anti-everything that is right. God says he's going to judge you. Now, maybe you don't like that, but you take that up with the Lord. You don't take that up with me, friend, because this is what he says in his word. And if I were you, I'd believe him because it seems to me to make sense to do that. Now, the intention of the Lord is beginning at verse 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Now, this is the day of the Lord's vengeance. We're going to see that again in Isaiah 63. You can't do anything to stop this. You couldn't any more stop this any more than you could put a few drops of distilled water up against Niagara Falls and hope you're going to stop it from running. You just can't stop it, my friend. It's coming upon this earth because God says things have to be made right. And they're going to be made right on this earth. And in order to make them right, he's going to have to put down evil and the rebellious man upon this earth. Now, there are a great many people on this earth that would not bow to God at all. Well, this is his universe, and I don't know where they could go. He has only one place for them, and it is labeled H-E-L-L. And you can think about that as you please, but it's lots worse than if it was made by fire. Now, that's the picture that's given here, and I'm not going into detail here. I have no desire to do that at all. I'm going to let you read this. Now, God's word is inviolate, not one word. Is going to pass, the Lord Jesus says, until all is going to be fulfilled. And it's good to read the weather report. And a storm is coming. We need to make arrangements for it. Now, when we come to chapter 35, thank God that war of Armageddon isn't the end of all things. We come now to the blessings of the millennium. And this is the picture of the kingdom in chapter 35, and let me give to you what I have written concerning this chapter. This is a poetic gem. There is a high sense of poetic justice in this chapter, which concludes the section on judgment. The fires of judgment have now burned out. The sword of justice is sheathed. The evening of earth trouble is ended, and the morning of millennial delights is come. This section closes on the high plane of peace on earth, plenty, and prosperity. God's method has always been through suffering to peace, through the night to the dawn, through judgment to salvation, through tears to joy in the morning. The calm of this chapter is in contrast to the storms of judgments of the last chapter, that is the one we just looked at, and those that even proceeded in it. We can say, as the writer of the Song of Solomon says, the winter is past and the flowers appear on the earth. Now we have here three sections. In the first two verses, material earth will be restored and the curse of sin lifted. This is the body of the earth. And in verses 3 through 9, men will be renewed. Their bodies renewed. This is the soul of the earth, mankind. And then the members of God's family will return to Zion in verse 10. And here you have the spirit of the earth. Now let's look at it like this. In verse 1 here, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Now, the deserts of the world today are not being reduced in size. Actually, they get larger each year. Drought and soil erosion are hastening this process, and today pollution fills this earth. All of this is going to be reversed in the millennium. The smog will be lifted and the curse of sin removed, and this beautiful statement that is here, 
The desert shall blossom as the rose. What a happy picture of the earth's future. Now, if you're familiar with the desert that's between me, where I am right now, and where most of you are that's listening to this program today, you're going to be impressed with this statement if you've ever traveled this desert. This outline that I've given here, I wrote this while I was crossing this desert, beginning up in New Mexico and coming to California several years ago. And it was at the time of a drought, and the sandstorms had eroded much of that which was vast grasslands. May I say to you, that'll be reversed. We're told in verse 2, it shall blossom abundantly. Rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, and the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Paul tells us that creation is groaning and travailing in pain today. In the millennium, all creation will rejoice. Now in verse 3, we see men are to be renewed also because the creation is waiting for us to get new bodies, you see. Now we're told, strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He'll come and save you. In the midst of the storm of judgments, God's people can rejoice because they'll know that God will come and save them. The church has the added hope and joy of never experiencing the great tribulation period. Then we're told here, Verse 5, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. Sickness and disease and all affliction are the result of man's sin. They're going to be lifted in the millennium. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and there's going to be a highway through this earth. What a beautiful picture you have here. And the ransom of the Lord. Now this is verse 10. They'll come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They'll obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Can't think of anything nicer than this. And this ends this particular section that we have here. And you can say with that old Puritan Baxter now, Hasten, O Savior, the time of thy return. Delay not, lest the living give up their hopes. Delay not, lest earth should grow like hell, and thy church be crumbled to dust. O hasten that great resurrection day, when the graves that receive but rottenness and retain but dust shall return the glorious stars and suns. Thy desolate bride saith, Come, the whole creation saith, Come, even so come, Lord Jesus. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain, waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. I want to close on that note, because next time we take up in chapter 36 the great historical section of Isaiah. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. The Highway of Holiness. Isn't that great? I love the uplifting conclusion chapter 35 gives to the dark night of judgment that we saw in chapter 34. There's so much hope and promise in Jesus. Well, May is here, and it's officially Letter Month at Through the Bible, so for those of you who maybe haven't heard of this favorite tradition in the past, the premise is really simple. Although we love to receive your letters anytime, we set aside a couple of times a year to specifically celebrate and ask you to write to us. Now, we love to know how you heard about Through the Bible. We certainly love to better understand that. And we also, more importantly, want to know what God's teaching you through our current study. Or how's the Holy Spirit using God's Word to change your life and inspire you to share what you're learning with those around you? We know that God's working in you and through you. So would you take a moment and share your story today? 
Reaching out is super easy. You can email us at biblebus at ttb.org, or you can send your note to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109, or in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. You can also call and leave a message at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Well, that's all for today. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here next time saving a seat on the Bible bus just for you. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Through the Bible exists to take God's whole word to the whole world. And we invite you to stand with us with your faithful prayer and financial support. Where will God's word go today?